Wow. I didn't know it could turn off that easy. We're glad that you're with us this morning. We really are. I tell you what, you got a good crowd this morning, and the fellowship is amazing. You stand up here just toward the front, and you can really hear it, can't you? The fellowship is amazing, and I'm going to tell you something. Let's encourage it more and more and more and get to know each other a little bit better all the time, right? If you didn't pick up a bulletin this morning, you need to pick up a bulletin. We're going to mention these names on here uh, concerning those who are sick, those who are hurting, those who are, uh, let's say, friends and neighbors of, of, of us who we're praying for, but particularly those who are lost. Let's remember them as we go, not only just in our prayers, but let's, in our actions as well. Remember what Jesus said to the seven churches of Asia? The first thing he said to them, I know your works. Let's make sure that God approves of their works, right? And ours as well. So when we, some of these are going to be those, and folks, you're going to have names that's not on this. If God if hears it in your heart, hears it in your mind, it's, it's there too, isn't it? So let's go through this list, if you'll please. Those that we need to remember. Keith Baker, the Blakeys, Marvin Clark, Wanda Cruz. I saw Pat over here this morning, Pat Cruz. Um, Janet Fisher, Susan Gamble, Gary Hart, Edwin Hill, Joanne Lawrence, Jerry Letterman, there you are, got surgery coming up, Bobby and Missy, um, John Mannery, John Nash, Nikki, Clydeine, Judy's here, I'm glad to see her, John Robinson, Shauna White, Samantha York, and those that are in care bound, Judy Borrell, Ronnie Barton, Faye Blazer, Marvin Clark's at home, Dean Horning, Mike Howard, Pat Lamb, Sandra Lumley, Pansy Schulke, and Eddie Watkins. Keep these in your mind as you pray every day. Mention them in your prayers and those others that we're not aware of, but particularly those who are lost. Remember them. If you would please just bow. Our God and our Father, we do thank you that you've given us the opportunity every day to approach your throne. We know, Father, that was the job of the high priest for so many years. We're so thankful that Jesus is now our high priest and he's given us the opportunity to approach the throne. We're so thankful, Father, that, that we can come before you as your children and knowing that you're hearing our, our prayers and, 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 and hearing those that we love. And, and we pray, Father, that you'll be with each one that we mentioned this morning and for those that's on their hearts now. We pray, Father, that you'll be with them and, and help them and be with the doctors and the nurses and, and the caregivers as they minister to each one of their needs. But we also pray, Father, that you be for those who have yet to put you on in, in baptism. For those, Father, who are, who are, are uh, away from you, those who have part of your kingdom at one time and now no longer part, we pray for those. And help them, Father, to to see their problems and, and to uh, repent of their, of, their, of their sinful nature and, and come back to you and be baptized and put into you. Thankful, Father, we have the opportunity to come before you today. And we pray that our worship will truly be, be that which you'll be proud of and it will uh, uh, uplift every one of us. Be with us now. May all that we say and all that we do truly be according to your word. Be with Rick as he breaks the word to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, for those of you that are visiting with us, 
really thankful for your attendance. I'm thankful to see uh, Brother John and his caretaker uh, here today. Uh, been praying for for John for some time now. I did understand that they've given him so much iron now that she can't get him too close to a magnet anywhere. So, but we're glad to have you, and, and John, we rejoice with you in your retirement as well. If you are visiting with us and you did not get a visitor's card, uh, we'd appreciate if you'd take one of those you'll find on the table in the foyer or just raise your hand and someone will see you get one, that we might have a, a record of your, your attendance with us this morning. <coughs> The sign-up sheet for the directory has the directory has not yet appeared, but it will eventually be on the bulletin board in the back. So I would encourage uh, all of us to take and pick a Sunday there uh, that fits our schedule, and get your photographs taken for the new new directors. I mentioned last week. Uh, some of us that had gray hair now have got red hair or black hair, and so we might not recognize you. So make those changes. Let, uh, let Rachel do her magic on us. So when that list comes up, be sure and, and get your name on there. And also, again, I want to remind us that if we want to make a special contribution toward the Ukrainian brethren, uh, please note that on your check that you put into the collection plate. And also, uh, Debbie has graciously provided again. Uh, in the back, you'll find uh, chocolate milk and juices and snacks. Uh, they're in the kitchen, and they're for anyone that wants them. So if you're interested, uh, they're the, there, uh, make use of them. Uh, this evening, uh, all of those that are uh, five years old and under, under, we encourage you to come down front and parents, uh, move down front with them. We're going to start again the youth focus that uh, Rick pursued last year, which I felt was really, uh, really successful. So young people, come on down front if you would. Next Sunday, we'll have uh, uh, Scott James from house to house, uh, and he'll be speaking in here a combined class uh, during that morning uh, period, and he'll also bring uh, the lesson for us. Nacho and Paul uh, will be leaving uh, for Columbia July the 4th. They'll be gone uh, through the 18th. We need to begin now to pray not only for their success there, uh, but for their safety in and out of the country. Ladies' Day, uh, this Thursday, the 31st at 1130, be for all ladies that have a desire, it'll be at J&L here just south of town. Also, this has been mentioned uh, last year, but a men's training class uh, a monthly men's leadership and service class is planned to begin on the second Sunday evening uh, starting in June from 4 to 5.30. So mark that on your calendars. Uh, also, uh, kids, kids Sunday evening, uh, Tim's assured us that there will be enough ice cream uh, Sundays for all of you, so uh, kids, it'll be your Sunday for Sundays. Also in the bulletin, B.J. Clark holding a meeting at Bonna, and uh, Dan Winkler will be holding a meeting in Sparta. Uh, your days, your times will be there. Uh, also mark your calendar, uh, May the 1st, Friends and Family Day. Uh, give you an opportunity to invite uh, to that. And I already mentioned all of those on our prayer list that 
are, uh, are in need of our prayers. They all do. But special ones on there. I would like for you to add uh, the name David Dame, D-A-M-E, uh, to, your, uh, to your prayer list at home. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what kind of cancer David's got, but uh, he got a report this week, and all they told me was, uh, it is not good. And uh, so I have an opportunity to talk to uh, David tomorrow. And I don't know what the outcome is, but as far as I know, he's not ready uh, to meet his Lord. So uh, please put David, David Dane, and his wife's name uh, is Corn, Cornelia, I guess, but she goes by Corn. Uh, but mention, mention them in your prayers, if you would, please. All of these, you need to check the bulletin board. These are uh, meetings that are in progress or will begin uh, today, some of them. And also, we have a letter from the Memphis School of Preaching. Uh, we've been supporting that effort for some time now. We have a thank you letter from them as well as a list of the speakers. And that lectureship starts uh, today and goes through the 31st. All this will be posted on the bulletin board. So for the time for those meetings, uh, check your bulletin board. Now as we enter into our worship service, we'd ask if you would please bow and let's begin with a prayer. <coughs> Father, we're thankful to you for the privilege to be your children for the opportunity that's been given us to offer to you our worship. We pray, Father, that it'll be according to your will. We pray, Father, that it'll also be the very best that each one of us as individuals have to offer to you. We're thankful, Father, that you adopted us into your family, that you promised us an inheritance beyond this life that we, we can read about and even then cannot fully comprehend. So great it will be. We know, Father, it's reserved for those that are your children. We pray you'll help us as your children to be uh, faithful to you, both, Father, in the way that uh, we live, the way we work, the way we act, we ask for wisdom, Father, as you send those opportunities to us, we pray for. And we ask, Father, for not just wisdom, but uh, determination, Father, to do the very best we can do to reach out to those that are lost. And Father, especially to those that are, are your children and for whatever reason they've been drawn back into the world, help us to plead for them and with them, Father, concerning what they're giving up and what it is that they have to look forward to if they do not return to you. And Father, it's our prayer that circumstance will be such in their life that while they have time and opportunity, Father, they will, will seek you. And if we can be your instruments to help bring that about, Father, we pray that it will be so. Again, we thank you for Jesus, and we pray, Father, in his holy name. Amen. Our song this morning will be 162, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Terry, would you turn that middle fan off, please, on the ceiling? Thank you. <coughs> All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen 
ransom seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Lo, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall we'll join the everlasting song and praise him lord of all we'll join the everlasting song and praise him lord One hundred sixty-six. One hundred sixty-six. He's my king. <coughs> All day long of Jesus I am singing. He my song of joy will ever be. All the while he keeps my heart bells ringing, for his love is everything to me. He's my king, and oh, I dearly love him. He's my king, no other is above him. All day long in raptured praise I sing. He's my savior, he's my king. Streams of love around my soul are flowing. From his heart flows everlasting spring. That is why my faith in him I'm showing. That is why an endless song I sing. He's my king. And though I dearly love him, he's my king, no other is above him. All day long, in raptured praise I sing, he's my savior, he's my king. In his light, I'm going home to glory, with the souls who trust his saving grace, going home to sing and tell his story in the blessed sunshine of my grace. He's my king, and oh, I dearly love him. He's my king, no other is above him. All day long, in raptured praise I sing. He's my Savior, he's my King. 144. And worship the King, 144. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, worship the King, O oh, glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor, and girded. 
his head. And let's sing this song before we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. <clears throat> been preparing to leave his disciples, twelve apostles that he chosen, and his the time is very short. Three years he spent in preparation for this time. And now he comes to this time and listen to his words from Luke, the 13th chapter, verses 14 and following. When the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them, with fervent desire, I, de I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. The Lord said, with fervent desire. I pray that our hearts are such that we have fervent desire to commune with the Lord because he's here with us this morning as we partake of this, the most sacred and holy feast. And it commemorates what he's done for us. And everything that he did in his life up to this point was for this time. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the cup of the vine, through the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup. This cup is the New Testament covenant of my blood, it's which is shed for you. The Lord had a fervent desire to come together around this table with us this morning. And let's remember that the Lord communed with us as we are with him this morning. Let's bow as we take the bread. 
Father, we're thankful for you and for all that you've done for us. We're so grateful, Lord, but we don't know how to accept such a great gift. Father, we're so unworthy, but you, we know that you've made us acceptable in your sight through the blood of your Son. And we thank you for all that he did and his body being nailed to that cross and was so miserably treated, Father, and it should have been us. But he went there in our place. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son on the cross to die for us, Lord, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents his shed blood. Lord, we pray we do it in a worthy manner that's pleasing in your sight. Thank you for your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings that we have, Lord. And we thank you. We ask you just to be with us as we prepare to give back to you. And that we can do it with a uh, cheerful and giving heart. And we ask that this money be used in a, a way that's pleasing to you and, and to uh, glorify you and your kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll have prayer at this time. Brother Robert. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee, Father, for another beautiful day you bless us with, Father. We're thankful for all the many blessings you bestow upon us daily, Father. We'd ask, Father, that you continue to help the sick and guide them back to health that they once had, Father. We're very thankful for all the recoveries we've had, too, here at Marshfield. Thank thee, Father, for all the teachers we have here at Marshfield that are willing to go out and cheat, uh, teach. We thank them that are involved in the jail ministry. We ask, Father, that you bless their efforts. We pray, Father, that everything we say and do is well-pleasing unto thee. 
We ask, Father, you forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. Our song before the lesson this morning will be 19, Come Thou Almighty King. And our song after the lesson for, for invitation will be 947, if you want to mark that, 947. Come Thou Almighty King. <clears throat> Come thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to pray, Father all glorious, o'er all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of Come thou incarnate word, gird on thy mighty sword, our prayer attend. Come and thy people bless, and give thy word success, spirit of holiness on us deep. To the great one in three, eternal praises to be, hence evermore, thy sovereign majesty, may we in glory see, and to Ron, I really appreciate your song selection with reference to Jesus being king and truly is our king. And what I want to do this morning is look at the kingdom that we read about in the New Testament, but we're going to focus primarily on the words of Jesus. This month's series has been what Jesus has said to us, and I appreciate one of our ladies in the congregation that gave me this idea of she mentioned that in, in working with the folks that are at the jail, that they have a great respect for the words of Jesus. So if something's said by Jesus, it counts. Well, it does. And that got me to thinking about the very concept that, yes, Jesus spoke a lot about very fundamental things that you and I, of course, need to understand. I'm excited about tonight. I want to encourage all of our couples with young children to be here a little bit early. We're going to try to get started about five, ten minutes before we begin the six o'clock hour. And we're going to ask that all the young people come up where Terry's sitting at. And, and you can shove him out of the way. That won't matter. And, and, and the almonds are already there. So they're in the right place. And come up if you got children. And I'm going to be stepping down there. And Wyatt's going to be down there leading our singing. And we're going to focus a lesson for the kids. And I was going to tell them to bring a flashlight because I was thinking about, well, it'll be dark outside, but it won't be. So we don't need to worry about bringing flashlights. But we are going to talk about lights tonight. And so plan on being here, if you can, a little bit early to get started with that. And I'm really looking forward to it. Excited about it. And from our past history, it's, it's been really enjoyed by all. So we're going to make efforts tonight to make that happen. Do appreciate so much your being with us, especially we have visitors here. It's so good to see the Nashes back with us. And, and John, I don't know if I can brag on him or not, but I, I, John, you can just close your ears for a moment. Would you do that for me? Just, uh, John has been a real help to me because he's, he's been going through and writing down reference scriptures as he goes through the Bible. And he's been studying through scriptures and and he writes those down, and then he puts the references there for me. And I've been able to reference those in classes, and also I've shared them with some of the other teachers. And I appreciate his work and effort. Despite being, being ill and at home, he has been busy, and we appreciate that so much. And, 
It's just been a joy for me to know that he keeps studying. And I want to encourage all of you to study. And anytime you hear something in a lesson you want to know more about, or if you've got questions about any of our classes, or anything that I say, come let me know. Because we want to make sure you know and understand as much of the scriptures as possible. Because it's going to count one day. Jesus made clear in his own words, as we've mentioned before, that we will be judged by the things that have been spoken, particularly the things he has spoken. And so these words are very important to our lives, and that's why we are looking at the kingdom in the words of Jesus. We're going to start by asking you to look at Luke chapter 4. You may want to turn your Bibles there. We're going to look at verses 42 through 44. And as we look at this passage and look, we read the words, Now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him. And that was common with Jesus. The crowds would seek him out, particularly early in his work and his ministry, because, because he was healing, he was doing things to prove and declare that he was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach. And notice what Jesus must preach. I must preach the kingdom of God. And he goes on to other cities also because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. And that amazes me that, that as you think about Jesus going into the synagogues of the Jews, there he could preach to them about the kingdom. And what Jesus would say would be fundamental to what the completion of his work was all about when he went to that cross, was resurrected, resurrected, and then gave Peter the keys of the kingdom. And as we think about that, we go to the very beginning of Jesus' life, or, or actually preparation for him being born into this world. Then the angel said to him, said to her, this is Gabriel speaking to Mary, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Most of us know that story of his birth, but I want you to notice what we continue to read in verse 32. And he will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne. Jesus, that was promised, not only in the prophecies of old, but directly to Mary, would be king. He would sit on the throne, and not just any throne, but the throne of his father David. And a lot of the Jews knew that prophecy, that, that it was to be a descendant of David that would stand on the throne or sit on the throne and reign in authority. And then verse 33, notice what is said. He will reign. Not he might. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. If I were to ask you who is the king of kings and lord of lords, you would know the answer, wouldn't you? You know it's Jesus. Not only was he prophesied, he fulfilled that prophecy, and he declared that he would establish his kingdom. Now, this prophecy came in reference to Jesus being born as a baby. And that baby would grow up. And he would become the Messiah. Now, if you were in Prague, there is there a church building. And I use that word in, its, in its sense it's used in the world. And it's called the Church of Our Lady Victorious. And then it goes on and declares itself to be the infant Jesus of Prague. And then what, what all this means is, if you can see the picture here, they, they have all over the building, they have a young child depicted dressed in a kingly garb with the crown. Now they got that part right, that it was Jesus declared to be king, and he would be king and king of his kingdom, Lord of lords, king of kings. But they don't picture Jesus growing up. What would it be that would make Jesus 
King of kings and Lord of lords. The resurrection declared to be the Son of God by the power of the resurrection. And, of course, the work that Jesus did in this earth was very important. But just in case you really kind of like that, I don't recommend this, but you can buy the doll that depicts Jesus this way for $36.95. But I highly do not recommend it because Jesus grew up. But apparently it's pretty popular because you can even buy them on Amazon. But a lot of people have bought certain things about the King Jesus that unfortunately has been distorted. Remember what Satan did in the Garden of Eden? He changed one word. A lot of people fall victim to Satan who wants to try to sell them something that is not the truth. And therefore they buy off on false teaching. And unfortunately, when the person buys off on false teaching, they put their soul in jeopardy. And they unfortunately may end up paying a terrible price, which is their soul, for falling victim to false teaching. Now, I don't mean to be judgmental, but I just point out the fact that Jesus said certain things. And, and what Satan wants us to believe is not what Jesus says. That's why it's important that we know what Jesus said. Because there's a doctrine that circulates that says that Jesus didn't establish his kingdom after he went to the cross. That he established instead of the kingdom a church age. And that someday he will return and set up a kingdom literally in Jerusalem and reign there. Now some of you are going, that's not right. And that's the problem. We have to know what is right. And so there's no better place than to go and to look at the words of Jesus himself. And we're going to move through this pretty quick, and our time's short, but I want you to follow along. In Mark 1, verse 14, we read that John the Baptist was put in prison. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel. And as you read what Mark says, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And in verse 15, we read, saying, the time was fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Do you see that? The time is fulfilled. And this is in reference to when Jesus is walking this earth. In fact, the time is identified. John has been put in prison. And now the time has been fulfilled. It is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. And that word is a very important word because we need to know he's saying it's close by, it's near. And so there is then, therefore, an obligation to those who hear the good news of the kingdom. And that is that they repent and believe the good news, believe the gospel that Jesus is preaching. Verse 17 of Matthew 4 reads, From that time, notice time element identified, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As you look at other translations, it will translate it near. Near. Close at hand, close by. When did Jesus say this? In the first century. And what would Jesus do? He wanted this message out. Not only was he preaching the gospel of the kingdom, but he sent out his disciples, his apostles, to preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look at verse 6, Matthew 10. But go rather to the lost sheep of house of Israel, Jesus tells them. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This was a definite message that Jesus wanted preached. Now, it's a factor of scripture we need to understand with reference to the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. As you look at the scripture, Matthew primarily uses the term Matthew, uh, or kingdom of heaven. Matthew does so because he's speaking to Jews and he wants them to understand that this is not in reference to what was in their mind because they were so consumed by looking at the prophecies and saying it has to be an earthly kingdom that will reign on this earth. And so Matthew, I believe, wants to distinguish by showing that it is a spiritual kingdom. And we'll see more about that in just a moment. But in Matthew 19, verse 23, Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now look at verse 24. 
And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You see how he uses it interchangeably? They are one and the same. So when you open your Bibles and you read the words that Jesus spoke in reference to the kingdom of God, in reference to the kingdom of heaven, you can know that he's talking about that essential kingdom that he came to preach and establish. And here's what's fascinating. In Matthew 13, verse 10, we read the words of Jesus and the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables, they asked. And he answered and said to them, because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it has not been given. What happens when somebody walks up to us and says, hey, Rick, I want to tell you something nobody else knows. You got my attention. Now, after they're done, you may say, I really didn't want to know that. But if you come up to me and say, hey, Rick, I want to tell you something you don't know about. What was Jesus doing? He was giving to them something they didn't really know about. The traditional view that had been accepted by the Jews that were in the synagogue was that Jesus was going to come, establish that literal kingdom, take over the throne, and free Israel from the domination of Rome. But Jesus is going to reveal to his disciples that there's more to the kingdom and that it's going to have a tremendous impact on the world because this kingdom is going to be a very special kingdom. That word mystery is a word which simply means that which is hidden or secret, not obvious to the understanding. And that Jesus was going to reveal what was necessary to understand the true nature of the kingdom because, you see, the problem with the world was they were looking for an earthly kingdom. But Jesus was trying to tell and get across to the people and even particularly to his disciples in the revealing of the mystery that he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And people need to read that. Some have tried to translate this as my kingdom is not of this age. That's not what it says. Jesus is trying to get across to the disciples. There wasn't going to be an earthly throne that he's going to sit on and take over the world and push Rome out. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. Jesus was not going to raise an army to conquer a world with a physical army of swords. And the world needed to know that, particularly the disciples. Now, unfortunately, some folks have, have not gotten that mem memo. Here's a guy who is in South America, and I believe it's, um, it may be Brazil, I just forgot. It could be Argentina. But anyway, he's down in the south. He's further south than the southern tip of, of the United States anyway. And what he's done is he is telling folks that he is now the king, Jesus. And it's interesting as he sits on the throne here that, that he's got a cross and you'll notice the sign, because what did the sign say? What, did, what was put on the sign that went on the cross? King of the Jews. He's claiming to be king, and he's got a few followers. I don't see big crowds in the pictures, but he's claiming to be the, the king of the world and sitting on the throne. <clears throat> I don't think he got the words of Jesus in red. Unfortunately, a lot of other folks did not either, and therefore they had fallen victim to the work of Satan. It was essential that the mystery be revealed and that the people of Jesus' day understand the kingdom. Verse 19, we read these words of Matthew 13. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, there is a great danger. Then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. Remember that parable? We'll not take the time to go into it. But what I want us to understand is that even in that, Jesus speaks of the kingdom and how important it is that we understand the kingdom. Otherwise, Satan can come along, steal the word. He can blind us to that which is true. And one of the 
true elements of the kingdom is what Jesus said to Peter. He said, Peter, after he made the confession, upon this rock I will build my church. Upon that very real confession that he was the son of God, Jesus made the promise to build the church. And what's fascinating is, is in verse 19, Jesus speaks. And you'll notice there I've messed up and didn't put the words in red. But notice what Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Who gets those? Peter, what for? Because he's going to unlock the door that would allow for folks to enter into that kingdom of God. And what an amazing thing to think about. In Acts 28, verse 30, Paul we read, I dwelt two years in his own rented house and received all who came to him. And look at verse 31. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Why was he doing that? Because in Acts 2, Peter took the keys, unlocked the door, allowed for folks to become members, not only of the church, but also the kingdom of God. What a marvelous thing. Peter opens the door that allows in his preaching folks to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what had Jesus done? He went to the cross, was resurrected so Peter could preach that great news that we can not only be members of the church but also of the kingdom. Now some people would argue with what we've been saying. I wish that... It wasn't true that they would, but they do. They argue, no, 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 no. The kingdom was not established when Peter preached on the cross. Well, that started the church age. Well, if that's true, we got a problem. One of the big problems is in verse 27 of Luke 9 that we got some folks that are still alive that's been alive for a long time. Because look at what Jesus said in reference to the timing of of the coming of kingdom. And this is where people miss it. you got to get the timing. Look at what Jesus said. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death. That word taste means partake of death till they see the kingdom of God. You know, when Jesus established the kingdom by the power of the cross and the resurrection of Christ, and when Peter took those keys and he opened that door to bind, he opened the door to something that was promised by Jesus. Something that Jesus preached about. Something that was very significant to the to man who would walk this earth in this world, and that would be the kingdom. Luke 21, verse 31. So you also, when you see these things happening, and he had a discussion of destruction of Jerusalem and even the end of the world. But he says this, referencing the kingdom and referencing that destruction. Know that the kingdom of God is near. What has Jesus been preaching? The kingdom is near. It's at hand. It's within reach. And then we read, Assuredly, I say to you that this generation... And this nails that time down. This generation. Who's he talking to? The people alive at that time. The people that he promised they wouldn't die till they see the kingdom. This generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. What? The kingdom of God would be established. It was truly near. In fact, Jesus told his disciples in Mark 14, verse 25, is recorded there, Surely I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. What did we do this morning? We took a time for remembrance, a weekly memorial, and what we partake? The fruit of the vine. He was with us. After the resurrection, Jesus, Jesus was seen alive with his apostles. They would learn, understand this more fully. And now we have the promise.
that we, when we obey the gospel, can become a part of the kingdom. We have proof of that in Colossians 1 verse 13 where the Apostle Paul writes with reference to be de being delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. When did that occur in the first century? What happened? People were able to become members of the Lord's church. They were translated out of that world of Satan into the kingdom of light and have their sins washed away where they could walk and live as citizens in the kingdom of God. And isn't it wonderful? We have the promise that when we partake of that fruit of the vine, when we partake of the bread prior to that, that our Lord's with us. What are we doing? We're doing what he established. Therefore, as a result of this and what Jesus said about the kingdom, the words that he spoke about priorities makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Notice in Matthew 6, verse 33, Jesus his, himself speaks, but seek first the kingdom of God. He says, put that as your number one priority. And that's hard for a lot of folks. Is we don't want to give up all those things that are take our time, but yet Jesus is saying here, there is a priority. The church, the kingdom of God needs to come first in your life. And notice he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. With reference to those things of the world that they were having to deal with, like eating and being clothed and so forth. But the end result is this. Christ is going to be the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5, verse 23. That body, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, is the church. The body is the church, and Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords over that church. And because he is, because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords over the kingdom, we have the promise that we are going to be part of the saved if we walk faithfully with him. And so, therefore, the kingdom must be priority. So much so, as Jesus spoke about it in Matthew 13, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. Think about this. Let's suppose that we took and made a list of everyone here in attendance this morning and said, okay, what do you have in the bank? How much money? For some of us, it would be real easy to uh, see $2. For others, it might be quite a bit more. It might have a few zeros on it. But we added up. It would probably be a pretty good sum of money that most of us could live on the rest of our life. But what's of more value? Take all of our assets. Let's suppose we sell our homes and our cars and our lands and, and gather up all the money and then make it into a big old pile. What's higher in that pile? Our souls and the treasure we have that was revealed through the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And that's why it's easy for Jesus to say the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. It is extremely valued, of great value. That's why when we look at the words of Jesus, he gives actually conditions for entry into the kingdom of God. You see, we have been given the privilege to be a citizen. It's just not dumped on everybody, is it? Oh, yes, God owns the world, and, and there is the world under his control, but, but we're talking about the church, the kingdom of God that he promised. And notice the conditions here in Matthew 5 as Jesus speaks. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. So that gives us a clue. We need to know what they were about and know that we need to gain something they did not have. Because Jesus said, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, one of the problems with their righteousness, they didn't depend on God for their righteousness. They were self-righteous. So we know clearly that self-righteousness is not going to make it. When it comes to the kingdom. And then Jesus in Mark 10 verse 15 said. Surely I say to you. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God. As a little child. Will by no means enter it. You see what's happening here. We have conditions for receiving the kingdom. And it's an obligation put on our part. Because God has done his part. 
He sent his son to the cross. He made sure we understood that Jesus was not held by the grave and, and therefore that Peter had that within his hands the keys to open entrance to the kingdom, but it's up to us to receive it. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means, he says, enter it. What does that mean? Like a, ch a, a child. We have to be humble, sincere, not self-righteous, but there's something about a child we might not think about. Unless we just left them here overnight and keep them here or, or, or over during the daytime, like uh, just leave them laying in the pew and we come back at 5 o'clock, they're still going to be here, but what's going to be happening? They're going to have some needs that needs to be taken care of and they're going to be hungry. You see, their dependence is upon another. The problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they didn't want to depend upon anybody but themselves. But if we're willing to surrender to Jesus, we depend upon him. You see, there's another aspect that we read about in Matthew 18, verse 3, and we'll get it close to our conclusion. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted, that's talking about a change of heart, and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. What does a child have that is so beautiful? Dad puts the child up on, on something high and says, jump. Will the child jump to his father? Because of complete trust in the father and the son. That's what Jesus is saying. Kingdom needs to be priority number one. And, and with that, we have complete trust in the father. And of course, the son, because he provided the way for remission of sins. And that's why Jesus would say, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He told Nicodemus that early in John 3, verse 3. What's this all about? Well, if you look at charts like this, what do we read? We read that baptism is essential for salvation. What happens? We obey that form of doctrine. Look in, in Scripture, that's the gospel. Death, the burial, the resurrection. We enter into Christ because we're totally dependent upon him and we're willing to have the faith that it's like the little child that, that will jump because of the trust in the Father. And then we're born again to walk in that newness of life as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6. Now I'm going to end this real quick, but I want to not miss this. In Mark 15 verse 42, Jesus is on the cross. It's the day before the Sabbath. And Joseph, in verse 43 of Mark 15, Joseph Arimathea, a council member, and he was prominent, Scripture says. And look at this about Joseph, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God. And so what does he do? We know the story. He asks for the body of Jesus. Pilate grants him that body, and then they wrapped him and prepared him to put him in the tomb. But what was Joseph of Arimathea waiting for? The kingdom. One more passage. You remember the thief on the cross? That thief knew Jesus wasn't an ordinary man, didn't he? Look at what is said. The thief speaks and says, We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Verse 42, Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The thief on the cross knew that there was a king, a true king on that cross. And what was even the thief looking for? The kingdom. And what's interesting, remember that concept of complete trust? He's on the cross. He's dying just like Jesus. But he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And don't you just love the words of Jesus? And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, 
you will be with me in paradise. That is the deliverance of the kingdom. In fact, that's what the kingdom is all about. That was not neglected and put off till some future date like these charts show. Jesus established his kingdom with the church, with the promise that that kingdom was there for mankind so that they could have the promise of deliverance that would come because of the king of king and lord of lords. And notice in verse 33, Luke 1, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom. There will be no end. And when is that kingdom going to be fully glorified? 1 Corinthians 15, after he talks about the gospel, he says, that then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to the Father. When he's put an end to all rule and all authority and power. One day this earth is going to end and what exists will be an eternal kingdom and we'll enjoy that privilege of heaven in the kingdom of citizens. This morning, one question. Are you a citizen of the kingdom? Are you a member of the church? Do you have a complete faith and trust in a father who sent a son to die for you? The plan for obedience to the gospel is simple, but you must start as a child, fully willing to surrender yourself to Jesus. And if you're willing, then there's no problem with repenting, confessing Christ, and being baptized. So we're going to stand, we're going to sing an invitation song, and if we can help you this morning become a member of the kingdom, the church, then why not make that known? As we stand and sing, would you come? trip on. We're going to close this morning with 578. <clears throat> 578, we will glorify. <clears throat> we will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty, we will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness, we will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, he is Lord of We
with me please for closing prayer tell me father we thank you for this day you've given us to come together to worship you study your word sing praises to you we thank you for all the many other blessings that you've given to us we thank you for rick the lesson he brought us this morning help us take it you put to use in our daily lives so we might be better servants for you lord we thank you for our elders for our deacons we pray that you will guide them in their decisions their responsibilities lord we thank you for those working in the jail ministry Guide them, give them the knowledge and wisdom that they need. Lord, we ask your blessing on our sick. We ask that they could be returned to their much wanted health. Lord, we give thanks to you for those who've recovered or recovering from their illnesses. Lord, we ask you guide us in everything that we do and keep us safe. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.